Hi, my name is Trevor Klee, and this is the GRE reading comprehension process. So uh, my overall goal with this process is to solve every reading comprehension question without ever reading the entire passage. So I think this is useful for pretty much anyone because it's very easy to get lost or confused in a reading comprehension passage, but it's especially useful for slow or quote unquote bad readers. Because I think a lot of slow readers or people who don't read a lot tend to get pretty lost in the complex uh, reading comprehension passages, spend way too much time, they don't know where they're supposed to get their answers for the questions, um, and then they end up getting, getting pretty lost. Uh, so if we can solve these questions with reading a bare minimum of the passage and never actually reading the entire thing, it's good for slow readers because they don't have to read the entire thing. And it's good for quote unquote bad readers because they won't get lost in these complex passages. So this is our goal. How are we going to accomplish this? Well, as you might imagine with the process. So um, here is the reading comprehension process. So in order to solve every question without ever reading the entire passage, first, we're going to skim the passage to get a basic idea of what it's about and how it's organized. We're going to focus on shifts and points of view. So I always want to be sure what do the author, what does the author believe? What does the people mention believe? Now, my preferred method of skimming is doing the first sentence in the last sentence of each paragraph. Uh, you don't have to do this. If it's a short passage uh, and there's really just like one paragraph, um, it might be better just to, you know, sort of uh, read the whole paragraph but not really try to understand it, you know, just sort of get a basic idea. The important thing is whether you do this first sentence, last sentence, which is what I'll be doing in the sample below, or whether you, you know, just lightly read the whole thing. We just want to get something basic like what it's about, just one sentence, how it's organized, how each paragraph develops the main idea here. So uh, if you find yourself focusing on details, you've gone too far. If you're trying to understand everything, gone too far. Just the basics. All right, now let's talk about number two. So once we've skimmed the passage, which of course we have to do um, you know, once per, once per passage, then we go to the questions. So for each question, we're going to analyze it for key terms. What is the question asking about? What specific sentence or sentences is the question asking about? And they're always going to be asking about one sentence, max two, right? They're never going to be like, some are, they're never going to be asking something that comes from an entire paragraph. So our goal here when we're analyzing this question is just to uh, figure out what specific part of the passage the question is drawn from. So what do you think step three is? Well, we're going to find and read carefully, carefully the exact sentence or sentences required by the question. So, you know, our organization here is going to help because that'll help tell us, you know, um, if we have a good idea of how the passage is organized, we'll be able to hone in on the exact spot that's been uh, asked about. But, uh, you know, it also helps just to do a little word search. You know, if it asks about, I don't know, women's history in the 19th century, we're going to, you know, skim the passage. What when do we talk about women's history in the 19th century? We're going to find that. Then we're going to read that sentence. We're going to read the entire sentence. Now, if the question demands context, like what's the purpose of this? Why does the author mention this? That sort of thing. We also read the sentence before for our context. But this is the limit of our reading, right? We're only going to be reading the exact sentence and maybe the sentence before for context. We're never going to be reading the whole paragraph. We're never going to be reading the whole passage. If you find yourself rereading the entire passage, 
then you've done something wrong. I'm going to put across to that. Then you've done something wrong. You should never find yourself rereading the entire passage. All right. And then last up, so we've uh, now figured out exactly which sentence or sentences is asking about. We're going to read and analyze each answer choice carefully, immediately crossing out any that seem incorrect. Now, here's, here's where uh, the GRE likes to pay, play their tricks. So one thing is that we're generally going to be looking towards our weaker answers. You know, if it says sometimes, maybe, occasionally, may, those are generally good answers just because they're almost guaranteed to be true. If I say it may rain tomorrow, yeah, that's probably true. If I say it will rain tomorrow, you know, that's a lot harder to prove. So generally speaking here, my weaker answers are going to be my better answers. Now, you might ask, well, what if I get stuck between two of them? Well, then you can go back to your sentence or sentences and like skim to see which one of those two is supported. Now, we want to keep that to a minimum, which is why crossing out is super important here. But sometimes it's unavoidable. Sometimes you have to, you know, go back and check. All right. So this is the process, and this is the same process that we're going to be following on every single reading comprehension passage. So skim the passage, analyze the question, find and read the exact sentence or sentences required by the question, go to the answer choices, immediately crossing out any that seem incorrect, and if you have to, go back to the passage. But don't do that for all of them because that takes a lot of time. All right, cool. So I'm going to show this uh, process at work on a sample passage. Um, this sample passage is drawn from my reading comprehension book, which is called the GRE Reading Comprehension Process, which you can find on my Gumroad page. So that's Gumroad. Sorry, that Gumroad.com. It's Trevor Clee. So. Just giving you a heads up that that's where my uh, reading comprehension book is, along with my other books on GRE stuff. Uh, so check that out, gumroad.com slash Trevor uh, if you want more sample passages and more examples of questions explained. All right, cool. Let's go into our sample passage. So I'm going to zoom in here because it's a little small. So we've got a long history passage here. Uh, and uh, just so you know, this is going to have more questions than your average GRE passage, just because I really want to give us practice um, using this, using these strategies. All right, let's go through it. So uh, I'm starting off with skimming the passage, and I'm going to read first sentence, last sentence in order to skim it. So we get, in 1870, Helena Wright Davis authored a history of the antebellum uh, women's rights movement and received approval of her account from many of the involved suffragists, including Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Okay, that's first sentence. And now um, we get last sentence. Uh, Stanton seemed to agree and addressed to the National Women's Suffrage Association in 1870. Subject to the women's rights movement, she said, the movement in England as in America can be dated from the first national convention held at Wor Worcester, Mass, October um, 1850. All right, cool. So Stanton agreed, um, and she, so uh, on the movement in England and America when it may be dated from. So let's, uh, basic idea of this first paragraph, Paulina Wright Davis authors a history of the antebellum women's rights movement. A lot of people seem to agree. Stanton agrees, and Stanton says, you know, this is when the movement can be uh, dated from. All right, next paragraph. In 1876, notice the time jump here. In the spirit of the nation's centennial celebration, Stanton and Susan B. Anthony decide to write a more expansive history of the women's rights movement. In 1881, they published first volume of History of Women's Suffrage and placed themselves at each of its most important events. 
Um, so for this one, we really have like a two sentence paragraph. So we just ended up reading the whole thing. Basic idea here, Stanton and Anthony write their own history. And in 1881, they published first volume of the history of women's suffrage. And they placed themselves at the most important events. So, you know, we already got this idea here. So, you know, originally there's this history and Stanton seems to agree. Then, you know, Stanton and Anthony write their own history and they place themselves at the center of each of its most important events. All right. According to Lisa Tetrot, so notice this, that's a change in point of view. A professor of women's history, the Seneca Falls Convention was central to their rendition, their rendition of the movement's history. Um, she positioned the Seneca Falls meeting as her own political debut and characterized it as the beginning of the women's rights movement, which she called the greatest movement for human Liberty recorded on the page of history, a demand for freedom to one half the entire race. So, uh, and if I look up, I see she is Stanton. So let's take a look at this one. So Tetro says the Seneca Falls Convention is central to their rendition of the movement's history because Stanton positioned the Seneca Falls meeting as her own political debut and characterized it as the beginning of the women's rights movement. So look, take a look at how this works, right? So Davis writes her history. Stanton agrees and says it can be dated from the first national convention. Stanton and Anthony write their own history and place themselves at the center. They use Seneca Falls as the beginning of the women's rights movement. Now there's a lot of other stuff going on in the middle here that's presumably important and that'll be asked questions about but I have the basic idea here. In other words, I have the primary purpose. So uh, whenever you finish your skimming, you should be able to answer any primary purpose question. You don't need to go further than that, but if you can't answer a primary purpose question, your skimming's been messed up. So the primary purpose of the passage is to elaborate how Davis's history was superseded by Stanton Anthony's. So superseded here means it's like, you know, Stanton Anthony's was better than it, right? Like it was more advanced, which definitely is not true, right? It's not how Davis's history is not superseded by it. It's not Stanton Anthony's history was better. It's Stanton and Anthony wrote their own history in which they were the heroes. So um, B, show that Stanton and Anthony deliberately overstated certain historical claims about the women's rights movement for their own purposes. Yeah, that's pretty good, right? they definitely overstated certain historical claims, right? About the beginning of the women's rights movement, probably some other stuff for their own purposes, mainly to show that they were at the center of things or to claim that they were at the center of things. All right, show that Stanton and Hith Anthony's history was incorrect. So, I mean, that's part of it, but that's not all of it, right? It was definitely incorrect, but like, a big part of this is why it was incorrect or why they wrote in an incorrect way. Well, because it served their own uh, served their own purposes. So C just doesn't capture all of it. Same idea, disprove the idea that Stanton and Anthony were at the center of the women's rights movement. I mean, they probably weren't at the center, but more importantly, it's this uh, idea about what the history was, right? The fact that they like, there was an accepted history, and then they wrote their own history to make themselves at the center of it. Um, and then present evidence regarding the disputed origins of the women's rights movement. No, it seems pretty clear that like the origins, you know, aren't really disputed. Like it's clear what the origins were. Just Stanton and Anthony made up their own origins. All right, so B seems pretty clear. Now let's go number two. The passage suggests that Davis held which of the following views about the Seneca Falls meeting. So if you remember, Davis is up here, right? Paulina Wright Davis. And this paragraph is about what Paulina Wright Davis says, right? The first paragraph. So uh, where does Paulina Wright Davis talk about this Seneca Falls meeting? Well, here, right? Davis's version gave the Seneca Falls meeting in 1848 a minor role equivalent to other local meetings that had been held by women's groups in the late 1840s. So Davis gave the Seneca Falls meeting 
1848 a minor role, said it was equivalent to other local meetings. So, although important, it was less important than the National Women's Rights Convention? Yes. Definitely. I mean, that's that's just true, right? Like, um, well, actually, actually, let's let's take a second here. Sorry. Um, I'm not actually sure about the important part because she said actually minor role. That's my bad. Let's actually cross that out or let's let's half cross it out because I'm not sure about this important thing. All right. It played a minor role in comparison to Stanton and Anthony's other conventions. Um, I mean, we get no evidence of that because, you know, we don't know what Davis thought about Stanton and Anthony's uh, other conventions. Uh, we just know that Davis thought it was minor equal in importance to other local meetings. So its importance was overstated by Stanton and Anthony. I mean, she probably thought that, but like we have no idea if she ever read Stanton and Anthony's like book or anything like that. So I don't know, maybe she died before it was published, in which case she wouldn't have held that belief. She had no idea what Stanton and Anthony thought. Uh, it was of equal importance to many other local meetings. This one is actually correct, right? So uh, we don't actually know that she thought it was important at all. She definitely know, we know if she thought it was like the same as a lot of other local meetings. Uh, it was supported by Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. That's just a misreading. So um, as you can see, these questions get pretty tricky. Um, now, what's key here is what's directly supported in the passage. So actually, A wasn't directly supported in the passage in the same way that D was. All right, student number three. The passage indicates which of the following with regard to the first volume of History of Women's Suffrage. All right, let's go back. That's, that's Stanton and Anthony's book. So Stanton and Anthony's book, right? We know this. They place, it was about placing themselves at the, each of its most important events. Um, let's see, this whole paragraph gives us other information about uh, History of Women's Suffrage. Um, so yeah, Seneca Falls is the beginning. So that's this sentence. Uh, oh, here we get a sentence uh, about additional information, pointing out that the uh, Tetrault said the women history of women's suffrage dealt with these earlier events relatively briefly in its first three chapters, first of which is titled Preceding Causes. Okay, that's some new information. We also get in the volume, Stanton did not mention some earlier events on women's suffrage at all. Rather, Stanton named the 1840 Anti-Slavery Convention in London as the birth of the movement for women's suffrage in both England and America. Okay, so we get some additional information here that we didn't know before about the history of women's suffrage, namely that uh, the, um, the history of women's suffrage deals with like stuff before Seneca Falls briefly in the first three chapters. And it doesn't mention some earlier events, but it names the 1840 Anti-Slavery Convention in London as the birth of the movement for women's suffrage in both England and America. All right, cool. So the passage indicates which one of the following with regard to first volume of History of Women's Suffrage, tired ignored competing origins of the women's rights movement, uh, no, so this entirely is incorrect, right? It just says like, oh, preceding causes. Uh, it did not indicate a women's rights convention as the origin of the women's rights movement. Yes, right? Because apparently it was the anti-slavery convention that they said was the uh, origin, the anti-slavery convention in London. Uh, it was written in an attempt to correct some of the mistakes of the history of the National Women's Rights Movement. Uh, we get no evidence of that. They seem to write it actually because they wanted to put themselves at the center of the Women's Rights Movement. Uh, it has since been disregarded by mainstream historians. Uh, we get no evidence of that. We know Tetro, it's not a big fan of it, but like it's unclear if other people are. Uh, it did not only include events that occur in America. Yeah, that's also correct, right? because it, it also included events that occurred in England, apparently. All right, cool. So, um, seems reasonably straightforward. Uh, let's do number four, 
the passage suggests which of the following inference is about Stanton. So this question doesn't have a ton of clues for us about where we go back, you know, because Stanton's mentioned a lot in this passage. So let's just use our previous knowledge. Um, one of her primary reasons for writing History of Women's Suffrage was to make her role in the women's rights movement more prominent. Yeah, definitely. So if I was pressed for time, I'd just select this and move on, but I'm not, so let's keep reading. Uh, Stanton falsely claimed that played a key role at the Seneca Falls Convention. Uh, no, disagree with that. Um, she, she did play a key role at the Seneca Falls Convention. She falsely claimed that it was like a major convention. Uh, Stanton had not been a prominent member of the suffragist movement prior to writing History of Women's Suffrage. No, because like, remember in the first paragraph, she gave some sort of speech or something. So no, um, Stanton was unaware of Davis's account until she published it. No, definitely not. She was definitely aware of it. Stanton claimed to have played a key role only at the Seneca Falls Convention. No, I mean, this only, this strong language is already turning me off, but it's also just not true. Like her whole point is she was a major role in like everything. All right, let's keep you on. Um, which of the following most accurately describes the author's primary purpose in including the underlined phrase uh, in the early 1870s, Stanton and Anthony began to present Seneca Falls, the beginning of the women's rights movement, an origin story that downplayed others' roles. So uh, remember, this is part of what we do. Uh, we're going to read the sentence, and then for the author's purpose, we're really asking for what's the context. So let's look for the context here. So I see the underlined phrase. Um, and we get context is, oh, so we're generally talking about why they did this. Um, Stanton, however, uh, had played a key role in the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. In the early 1870s, Stanton and Anthony began uh, to present Seneca Falls as the beginning of the women's rights movement, an origin story that downplayed others' roles. Okay, so that's generally just talking about like, you know, that Stanton had played a key role in this. And so they start uh, portraying Seneca Falls as like the beginning of the movement because it serves their purposes. Um, so let's say, um, uh, so why did the author include this? Um, to argue that Seneca Falls, Stanton and Anthony misrepresented the Seneca Falls Convention? Uh, maybe. I mean, that's not why they include this phrase specifically. Um, so this is maybe um, to provide evidence of the sort of claims. So this is not evidence of the sort of claims that were originated in women's history of women's suffrage. Um, to offer an example of the sort of false claims that Stan and Anthony made, eh, no. So B and C are pretty similar to each other. Like we're not just doing like an example of this, right? It's something more key about how Seneca Falls is the origin, right? Like that seems important. To elaborate on Tetrault's claim that Stanton and Anthony used the Seneca Falls Convention to key their rendition on women's rights history. Yeah, this seems good, right? Because this whole passage is about Tetrault's thing. And like, you know, we're going through like Seneca, like Tetro talks about Seneca Falls. Yeah, this whole thing is about Tetro. So I like D actually. And then E, give an example of sort of claim that Davis repudiated, that's just false. And then A, yeah, it's not just arguing that they misrepresented it, right? It's more saying like, you know, um, uh, it's more in the context of like Tetro's idea that like Stanton and Anthony are deliberately um, like sort of misrepresenting it like for their own purposes. So yeah, so A is like too narrow. It's like, why were they misrepresenting it? All right, cool. And last up, number six, which of the following findings would most weaken Davis's assertion about the beginning of the women's rights movement? Davis at the beginning. So let's figure out what Davis's assertion is. So Davis's assertion is, oh, I see it here. Uh, Davis said the beginning of the National and International Women's Rights Movement at Worcester, Massachusetts in 1850, National Women's Rights Convention when women from many states were invited. 
uh, the influence of which was felt uh, across Scotland and in Great Britain. Okay, so, you know, I think we've got a pretty good idea here. Davis uh, said that this was the beginning of the national women, international women's rights movement because women from many states were invited, um, influence of which was felt across the continent and Great Britain. Um, yeah, so I think this is reasonably straightforward here. Um, so if we're trying to weaken this, we want to get this sense of like, yeah, like, you know, it does seem like a pretty strong claim. You know, a lot of women were invited. Influence was felt across like uh, North America and Great Britain. So let's let's see what we can do. A uh, prior meeting about women's rights had been held before 1850. We actually already know that because, like, first of all, like, you know, we know that Seneca Falls was held in 1848, right? That was, like, you know, sort of a big part of this, right, 1848, that sort of thing. So we know there are prior women's rights conventions. So, you know, A is not great. Besides, it doesn't really say, like, it doesn't really affect her reasoning for it, right? Her reasoning is not just, oh, this was a meeting. It was, this was the meeting, you know, it was national, it was international. All right, not all the invitees intended the National Women's Rights Convention. Ah, uh, see, that one's like, okay, but the issue is we don't know what not all means. If it was like zero, then yeah, that'd be definitely weaken it. You know, if you invite a bunch of people, but nobody comes, that would definitely weaken it. Like if one person didn't come, you know, then it wouldn't weaken it. So, you know, B is not great. C, a very widely attended women's rights convention had been held the year before in England, which spouted the American National Women's Rights Convention. Uh, that's pretty good. I mean, like, you know, that would suggest that the National Women's Rights, whatever, uh, National Women's Rights Convention was important, but not like, the origin like c would suggest like oh there was something else that there was the origin and like this later meeting was just sort of following along from it c is pretty good uh, mainstream historians did not identify this meeting as the beginning of the women's rights convention after stanton challenged it uh we don't care about that it's a question of what's true not what mainstream historians think you know if whatever they think it doesn't matter if it's true or not um and then a number of men also attended the convention. That's totally irrelevant. All right, so C is the best one here. You know, that's the only one which actually link, uh, weakens her reasoning, which is like, you know, uh, like this idea. Okay, so a lot of people attended from all across and there was a big influence. But if there was one right before, which also had as big of an influence, well, you know, then you can't really say that's the origin. All right, cool. So that's my reading comprehension lesson. Um, so summing it up, right, we're trying to read the bare minimum, skim the passage, analyze the question, find and read the exact sentence or sentences, read and analyze each answer choice carefully. Uh, once again, if you want to see a lot more examples of this passage in action, get my reading comprehension book, which is at gumroad.com slash Trevor Clee, and uh, like and subscribe. Uh, to get some more videos on the GRE verbal section. All right. Thank you very much.